Welcome back to another episode of Haunted and Historic Australia's Criminals, Cutthroats and Convicts. In this two-part special, we are looking at the perfect poisoners of Australia, the Black Widow and the Ferryman. This episode, it's the Black Widow. Back in the 1800s, poison was a quick way of getting rid of someone you didn't like. Various illnesses were coming from other countries. Smallpox, measles, scarlet fever were going rife and it wasn't uncommon for people to have symptoms of vomiting and restlessness, fever before succumbing to any of these illnesses. Doctors are still trying to work out what had befallen them. And in some cases, it was as plain as the fact that they'd been poisoned. In these two cases, the question begs, why did they try and poison their loved ones? It's strange. The motives aren't all that clear. Now, the Black Widow, or Black Widow Spider, isn't all that deadly. Although her bite is toxic, you can survive if you get to a hospital pretty soon. And... Occasionally, she is known for eating her mate. In this case, the Black Widow we're talking about is Louisa Collins. Now, chemists were required to keep a register of any poisons that they sold anyone. Possibly, as there were a couple of cases earlier on in the 1800s of a Madeline Smith who tried to do away with her husband, and arsenic strychnine and cyanide were often purchased from a chemist for basic duties a woman would have to do such as washing or to add in cosmetics and of course to kill rats there was quite a lot of vermin around and a lot of it came off ships that came in the early 1800s a lot of them came from ships carrying convicts and After a couple of decades, Australia had its fair share of vermin and cockroaches and possibly things that the first people would never have had. Thank you, European settlers. So naturally, they had to have things that were most likely used in Europe to get rid of rats. But as it's found, many of these women and on our second story, the occasional man, would purchase this poison for common home uses and unfortunately for their partners whom they wanted to kill sometimes they weren't found out but in these two cases the perpetrators were and that's why we've got this good story for you today our first story starts with louisa she was born in 1849 as louisa hall to parents henry and catherine who were employees at Beltrees, a well-known country property in the Hunter Valley. As a child, she was a lovely girl. Many people in the town loved her. And as she matured, she was a beautiful and attracted a lot of attention from boys her own age. She got a job at 16 as a housemaid near Merowa. She attracted the attention of an older man, a widow, a butcher named Charles Andrews. He was a hard-working man and her mother, Catherine, was quite keen on her marrying him as he was probably fairly well off. I mean, he was a widow and probably collected insurance on his wife's death. So he had money and parents would hope that their female children would marry well and have a good life and often better than what they had. However, in doing this, it upset Louisa. She was only 16 and Charles Andrews was 36. He was 20 years older than her. A lot of girls were married young as times were tough and a lot of these families, God-fearing families, didn't believe in contraception and things like this. So a lot of children were had and it was better off getting rid of the children as early as possible and marrying them off where they can, especially the girls, so as they weren't such a burden on the rest of the family. And in this case, her mother really did see a benefit to Louisa marrying an older man with money. So it happened. They were married on the 28th of August in 1865 at a church in Merowa. After some hardship as a butcher, they had to move from the country towns up north to Sydney City to the slums. Originally, they lived in Waterloo, which was a a southern suburb of Sydney. However, after they had their first child, Herbert, 
they moved into a semi-detached cottage at 10 Popples Terrace in Lower Botany. This area was known as Frog's Hollow. It was flat and desolate, could only be reached by a narrow bridge spanning the swamp. Louisa was not happy, but she has seven children to this guy. The area was sparsely populated. Many of the neighbours were wool washers and fell mongers. She grew ever so resentful towards her husband for basically putting her in this position. Frog's Hollow was a bit of a slum, and I'll see if I can get some original photos of Frog's Hollow up, but it wasn't the kind of place that a young woman foresaw herself, especially coming from the beautiful Hunter Valley area. Now at this point, she's given up on her husband. She goes down to the local pub, the Pier Hotel on Botany Road, and drinks washing away her sorrows but after a while she starts to get the attention of the men down there and finds a new lease in life she starts relationships or relations with many of the men at the pub and a lot of this got around town she was known for going down to the p hotel and having men stay at her home as boarders she put the idea to charles some time before so as they could raise a little more money and hopefully get out of Frog's Hollow. But Louisa had no intention of leaving. Not now. She was having too much fun. Especially in 1886, where she met a Michael Peter Collins at the Pier Hotel. He was a 22-year-old casual labourer from Ballarat in Victoria. And now, he was 14 years her junior. She thought he was stunning. She invited him to live at the cottage with her and her husband and her kids. He didn't seem to mind. He must have been just as taken with her. After some time of the affair, most of the people in the town knew about it. And Charles Andrew was pretty much the last to know. But whether he ignored it or overlooked the situation because he knew his wife was unhappy, it eventually came to a head. Nine days before Christmas, Charles had had enough. He stormed into the room that Michael was staying in and grabbed the man by the scruff of the neck, threw him through the front door and his belongings after him. Louisa knew that there wasn't a lot she could do. She tried talking to Constable Jeffs at the local police station, but he, along with many of the townspeople, knew about the affair and passed it off as just Maybe you should go back to your husband, Louisa. Louisa was mad as hell. She had made it up in her mind that it was all Charles's fault. He'd made her what she was now, an unfaithful woman. If he'd taken better care of her, they wouldn't be in this mess. She wanted to be happy and he was standing in the way of it. Something had to be done. She had to get rid of him. Now Herbert, their oldest son was now living in Maitland. He was old enough to look after himself. Not long after Michael had been thrown out of the home, Louisa asked the local draper who had a store, Mr Bullock, how soon after death could insurance money be collected? It was really strange as Mr Bullock also knew her husband, Mr Charles Andrews. So it's very strange that she would ask such a question. Her husband, Charles, told Mr Bullock the draper that he would call around with a nice piece of pork. Being the butcher of the town, that was his duty. And when Mr Andrews didn't show up, Mr Bullock got a thinking. Now, as it happened, Charles Andrews was violently ill. And by the Monday, Dr Marshall went and called on him at 3 p.m., he wasn't well at all. It was almost like he had some gastrointernal problem. By the Friday, Mr Charles Andrews had died. The cause of death was acute gastritis by Dr Marshall, who'd seen him on the Monday. On the same afternoon, while Mr Andrews' body was still warm, Louisa took a tram to the city to claim the insurance money of a dead husband. It's quite soon, isn't it? It was to be claimed from the Australian Widows Fund, and 
her idea was that, well, I've got hungry children to feed. I need money now my husband can't work. What's going to happen to his business? The following day, Louisa called on a neighbour, Mrs Price. How is Charlie feeling? asked Mrs Price. Oh, he's dead, Louisa replied casually. I'd like you to help me if you would lay him out for the funeral. Mrs Price was quite shocked at how calm Louisa was after her husband just died. Days later, Louisa called on Mr Bullock the draper and ordered some brightly coloured dress material. He seemed quite surprised and Louisa must have picked up on this. I can mourn Charlie in my heart without having to carry my grief in my clothes. Three days after Charles had died, Louisa threw a crazy party that ran all night at the Frog Hollow Cottage. And after the party finished, Michael moved back in. Now, Herbert up in Maitland has no idea that his father has died or that there was a funeral. He returns home after hearing of this some time later and he's very upset with his mother and finds Michael Collins in his father's bed. If she had given him a share of the insurance money, it could have helped him open a shop and be able to support the family. Herbert was most unhappy with his mother. Nine weeks after Charles Andrews' death, on April 9th, Louisa married Michael at St Silas Church of England in Waterloo. On the marriage documents, Louisa even goes as far as to put her age down to 28 instead of the 38 that she really was. They were living quite comfortably on the inheritance that Louisa received from Charles Andrew. Now, the funny twist in this story at this point is that Mr Charles Andrew, the butcher, who had been 20 years her senior, was a hard-working man just as her mother had said. Now, Michael, Mr. Michael Collins, was anything but hardworking. He was a moocher, and he was quite happy to sit on the inheritance that Louisa had and not make any attempts to find work himself. Louisa liked to drink and spent a lot of the inheritance money on keeping up her habit, as well as buying lavish clothing for herself and her new husband. But after some time, as some of this money had run out, Louisa started pushing Michael to find work. We can't live on this inheritance forever. You're going to need to find work. So Michael would start going out looking for jobs, and often come home with less than what he started out with. He would borrow money to go and take trains and things to look for work and then come back with no money and on one occasion he didn't come back with a nice, with a lovely watch that Louisa had bought him soon after she collected the inheritance money. He made up some story that a station master had taken it from him when he found he couldn't pay for a fare. Louisa was very confused and very upset that the watch was now gone. It was soon realised that Michael was actually going out and gambling. He would take money, stating he was looking for work, but really gamble it away. He even got a job, but was sacked three days later. Soon enough came the time when there was no more inheritance money left, except £20. He begged Louisa that he was on a winning streak if only he had that £20, he would come back with more money. He went out that night and came back miserable. He hadn't made any money from the gambling that he'd promised he was on a winning streak and Louisa had given him that last £20. But they had nothing now. Although they had been fortunate to be able to move into a better class area, now they had to move back to Frog's Hollow when all the money had dried up back to the slums. Louisa was pregnant with Michael's baby, but at five months old, the baby passes away. Michael becomes disillusioned. Louisa becomes more miserable. She's no longer happy with Michael. 
Michael has fallen into a bad depression and has no ambitions to find work. Louisa begins drinking heavily again with whatever money that they can find and goes back to the Pier Hotel where she tells her old friends that Michael turned out to be a good-for-nothing loafer and she would be better off without him. Louisa was neglecting the children too and they were grubby and the house was a mess. Michael didn't do anything at home either and just in a depressed state lay on the couch for most of the day. Many people felt sorry for Louisa. She'd lost her baby and her first husband, although she didn't seem to worry so much about Charles's death. But when Michael passes away, suddenly, everyone is really concerned. Two husbands have died now, and they weren't that old. There was a lot of speculation, but Michael wasn't insured for life insurance, and he was actually making 36 shillings a week. So there was a lot of talk in the town. Two husbands dead. Had she done them both in? Or was she just really unlucky? Before Michael passed, he complained of abdominal pains. Dr. Marshall was called in again to see him. He would later state that Louisa was looking after him with all the cares. A dutiful wife. After he passed, Louisa stated that she found some powdered substance in the pants that Michael was wearing and insisted on wearing the whole time he was sick in bed. Dr Marshall was very concerned about the way he died and how similar it was to the first husband, Charles Andrews. He reported his suspicions to police who came and searched the cottage. In the kitchen, they found an unwashed glass that contained elements of arsenic. She was arrested on July 12th of 1887. They were so suspicious of Louisa after the traces of arsenic were found in the glass that they exhumed Charles's body and checked it for traces of arsenic. It was found in both of the men's bodies. During Louisa's trial, they even put young May, her 12-year-old daughter, on the stand who had said when she was questioned that she saw a rodent killer tin, rough on rats. It was a tin containing arsenic. Little May had seen it in the kitchen. It must have matched what was found in the bodies because her trial began on August 6th, 1888. The jury were divided and could not agree on what they thought. It took four trials for the government or the powers at be to get the verdict that they wanted. Three times, three separate trials, they could not reach a guilty verdict. So on the fourth trial, they pretty much pressured the jury into making a decision and making it favourable to them, which is they wanted her guilty. The Premier at the time, Sir Henry Parks, was one of the main men behind her being hung. Normally after a few trials, the person is reprieved as nobody can make a decision, but Henry Parks wouldn't have it. They wanted to make an example out of her, as previously there'd been a lot of backlash to the Mount Rennie Rapist case where many of the guys involved were hung. They were executed, which is pretty just if you ask me. However then, a few years afterwards, however, there was the Maitland murder case, whereas mother and daughter plotted to kill daughter's husband. I won't give too much details here, just in case we make this one into a story too. But the two women aren't hung, and this also caused a backlash. Well, you're executing men, but you're not executing women, and those men aren't killing the woman, and these women are killing the men. There was a bit of a gap and a divide between the people of New South Wales and Henry Parks was feeling this backlash. He wanted to make sure that under his governing, from now on, if you killed, you would be hung. December 8th, they found her guilty and she was sentenced to death. A group of women got together and pleaded for the life of Louisa. They even had little May stand up 
and plead for her mother's life. Some believe that this actually started the suffragette movement in Sydney, perhaps appealing to Louisa Lawson, Henry's mum, back in 1888 when she first started a feminist magazine called The Dawn. It may be that she heard about the trial or was there petitioning for her release. We won't know entirely but it's quite possible this was the beginning of that movement. But for Louisa Collins, all efforts were in vain. She wasn't going to be reprieved. She would hang in Darlinghurst Jail. Shortly before this took place, she wrote a letter to her mother, the mother that forced her into a loveless marriage all those years ago, but perhaps to save face with her mother, who was now blind anyway, she wrote a letter stating that Michael Collins was a loving, attentive man, tall and handsome and fond of children. He was a good man. Whether her mother ever read the letter, or whether or not she intended her mother to even receive it, perhaps it was just a ploy to try and get her out of being hung one last time. She even wrote a letter to the Governor, Carrington, two days before her death. Oh, my Lord, Pray have mercy on pity on me and spare my life. I beg and implore you to have mercy on me. I have seven children. Spare me, my Lord, for their sake. That didn't work either. On the evening before she was hung, Mary, Herbert and Frederick, three of her children, came to see her in her cell and they wept, saying goodbyes to each other as well as praying for a miracle. That miracle didn't come. Louisa even said leading up to this, they'll never hang a woman here. She would be the first woman hung in Darlinghurst Jail and the last woman hung in New South Wales. At 9am on the 8th of January 1889, Louisa, in front of 12 people, was taken the gallows and hung for the murders of her first husband, Mr. Charles Andrews, and her second husband, Mr. Michael Collins. I would like to be able to say that she was hung swiftly and without issue, but I can't. The hangman Nosy Bob was well known in the Sydney area at this time and took up the executioner's role as he was very disfigured due to being kicked in the face by a horse which destroyed his nose. He had been a cab driver and now with this serious disfigurement he couldn't get passengers any longer and he had a wife and children to support so he became the executioner or the hangman at this time apparently misjudged the drop and nearly tore her head off apparently there had been a bolt that had been stuck or something of the nature when she dropped she fell awkwardly and the way in which she fell The noose cut into her neck, almost severing it from her body. A ghastly way to end a woman's life, even if she had been ghastly in her life. No one really needs to go like that. But what an end. The reason she killed Michael is not really clear, as he was earning at the time. But was that money going to gambling? I do believe Louisa loved Michael, but perhaps... Something kicked in and she decided she had to do away with him. He was draining the family too much. Either way, it is such a strange story. And there has been speculation that she didn't kill him. Although both bodies had traces of arsenic in their systems and both of them had had turns of working with sheep's wool as tanning and the wool actually being tanned, contained arsenic. Although it's been proven that the amount of arsenic that was used on the sheep's wool wasn't enough to kill them, and if so, why wasn't everybody just dropping off like flies? The question poses, it had to have been done deliberate. Louisa did state at some point that that Michael must have been doing it to himself to commit suicide. But would you go through that much pain? trying to kill yourself. It's very strange and 
it really seems more likely that it was Louisa. But I guess she denied it all the way to the noose. She professed her innocence the whole time. Louisa's story has been told many times and is in many books, notably these two, which have so much information and one even goes back as far as locating her descendants. Not only does Louisa have a book, but Nosy Bob features in one too. Why not go and check them out? Stay tuned for part two of The Perfect Poisoners with next week's episode, The Ferryman. And if you enjoyed this episode of The Black Widow, definitely like, subscribe and share and let us know in the comment section if you like. But don't forget to hit the notification bell just to make sure you're getting the updates on when we're putting up our next stories. But sometimes the hunter becomes the hunted. A black widow spider has set her snare of silk underneath a thorn bush.